Good morning, Emmanuel Church. It is great to be here with you on this beautiful Sunday, Sunday morning. I love it. We had an awesome night last night, Trunk or Treat. This year's Trunk or Treat is in the books. Uh, We had over 90 of our church family, uh, 90 people uh, who were serving last night, representing our church and loving our neighbors well. It was an awesome night. It was a beautiful day yesterday, and we had over 370 of our neighbors that came through Trunk or Treat yesterday. Uh, It was such an awesome time, and you guys represented so well. And I just want to say thank you to all of you that that hosted a trunk, those of you that worked in the kitchen tent, uh, maybe the welcome tent, also out in our parking lot, uh, and those of you that helped set up and tear down. It was just an incredible night. So thankful. It was a great thing because many of those people that walked through Trunk or Treat would never have stepped foot on our property if it wasn't for an event like that. And so they got to come and experience the love of Jesus. And that's what that's all about. So thank you for loving our neighbors well. We so appreciate that as a church. I uh, also want to mention some things that we have coming up. Uh, election hospitality workers needed. As you know, this Tuesday is the election, and we are a polling site as a church. And so a part of that and wanting to be continuing to love our neighbors well, uh, we do a hospitality table. Um, and so we need people that are willing to sign up for a two-hour shift to be able to make sure that that table is replenished with food and looks great and is just a smiling face for those as they walk in and or as they leave. And so if you're interested in serving in that way, you can sign up on our church website or you can sign up down in the foyer as well. So we encourage you to do that. Um, We also are going to be tomorrow night doing an election prayer service. So we we encourage you to join us at 6.30 p.m. right here for the one-hour prayer service. Uh, We're going to be be leading through a variety of different formats and uh, topics of prayer as we continue to trust God that His will will be done for our nation. So we encourage you to come on out and join us for that uh, tomorrow night. It's going to be an awesome time of just connecting with God and one another. So... Well, we are here to worship the Lord Jesus. Amen? Amen. Will you stand with us as we come into a time of worshiping the Lord? Well, good morning. It's good to be here to worship with you guys this morning. It's good to be in the house of the Lord, getting to worship our Savior, our God, and our King. This morning, we're going to start off by reading a portion of Psalm 103 together. And this psalm gives us a lot of reminders of what our God did for us and gives us lots of reasons of why we should praise the Lord together. Here it goes. It says, Praise the Lord, O my soul. All my innermost being, praise His holy name. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all His benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things so that your path is renewed like the eagles. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquity. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Praise the Lord, O my soul, all my inmost being, praise his holy name. So church, we have a lot to give the Lord praise for. He's redeemed us. We are free because of what he did for us on the cross. So this morning, let's give him all of our praise, all of our worship. Let's worship him with all of our heart and all of our soul and all of our mind. So let's praise him together. Here we go. There's a fountain blessings overflow. We're living water on the stream from the mercy seat. The joy I know deep inside my bones is never ending well. Where I thirst no more, rejoice, rejoice, my soul. Come on, rejoice. 
going to be transitioning into a time of partaking of communion together. Uh, hopefully you were able to grab uh, one of the communion packets that are back there on the table when you came in. If you didn't, uh, just slip your hand up and one of the deacons are going to come around and make sure that you get one in your hands and just keep your hand up until they uh, are able to get to you. Uh, you don't have to be a member here at Emmanuel Church to partake of communion with us. We only ask, and it's important that you know Jesus uh, to, to partake with us. And parents, we encourage you at this time to uh, supervise uh, how you are going to handle this with your children. Uh, if you feel that they're ready, or maybe you feel that they're not ready, uh, we trust you to, to take care of that and oversee this time. Do this in remembrance of me. Words that Jesus said as he was leading his disciples and partaking of the bread and the cup. Do this in remembrance of me. This set off something that we do regularly. Every single month we take time to do this in remembrance of him. To reflect and remember Jesus' sacrifice on the cross for you and for me. His suffering and his death. The love that he showed and displayed that day, that day that moments that were so dark and then a time after that was so bright and amazing because he gave us new life. And so we take time, and this time, to be able to reflect on that. And isn't it fitting that as a part of this, that as the same, the same heart that Jesus showed, the same love for which he displayed to us, that we would in this time allow to go inward and also to go outward. Some of you right now maybe are carrying some shame with you, perhaps because of some unconfessed sin. Some of you might be sitting here with bitterness in your heart towards someone else. We want to take a moment here this morning to deal with that. If you're dealing with shame, take a moment here to confess that sin to the Lord and to give it to Him and to say, Lord, thank you for what you did on the cross. That same love that you showed for me, I'm now going to allow to come inward towards myself and I'm going to receive that love. And for those of you that maybe you're holding on to some bitterness and some resentment towards someone else, maybe this is that moment that you take and you say, Lord, I'm handing this to you. I am forgiving this person. I don't want to hold this burden anymore of bitterness. So we're going to take a few moments here before we partake of the elements. We're going to take to deal with those things right there before the Lord. And so in this time, I just encourage you, allow the Holy Spirit to search your heart, to reveal what's in there, and allow the Lord to do a work as we surrender to him. Let's take a few moments here.
Jesus loves us. Doesn't it, isn't it so fitting? Doesn't it make so much sense that as we remember what he did on that day, that we apply what he did to ourselves and to others? And that's what we just took a moment to do, is to apply what he did, what he accomplished, the love that he showed to us. We allowed it to seep in, and we allowed it to go through us to others. As we prepare to partake of the bread, I encourage you to take the small part, looks more like the bottom of the packet, and open it up to get the bread and hold it in your hand. Jesus, on the night in which he was betrayed, he took the bread and he said, this is my body broken for you. Do this as you remember, or do this as you partake of it in remembrance of me. Let us partake together. said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us partake together. Lord Jesus, we're so thankful. Your body, which was broken, that took our place your blood that was shed for giving us forgiveness, defeating sin, allowing us to be able to just sit here knowing, Jesus, that we have your grace, that we have your mercy, that we can live free because of your forgiveness. And so, Lord, we thank you for this. Lord, I pray that as a response out of our heart, truly out of the depths of our beings, may we praise you this morning. May we not let it just be trapped inward, but Lord, may it just flow out of us this true thanksgiving of realization of what you accomplished for me, what you accomplished for each person in this room. Jesus, thank you. And we're thankful. And we give you praise for all what you're going to do in your name. Amen. Will you stand as we continue to worship the Lord?
is worthy of it all. We just celebrated what he did for us on the cross. three that we just read at the beginning praise the Lord oh my soul all my innermost beings praise his holy name let's not hold back our worship of our praise of him he is worthy the slip of our voices to him
when we reflect even a moment on the sacrifice that you gave for us. And we think about your body being put into a tomb and the stone being rolled in place. And the hopelessness that is found in that until, until on that third day you walked out. How can we do anything but praise you, God? How great are you, God? For all you've done, and especially for the sacrifice that you gave for each one of us. Jesus, as we praise your name today, as we come before you today with our our limited ability to be able to voice what we really feel down inside. I pray, Lord, that the groanings of our heart you would hear as we try to put forth our praise to you and our, try to express our deep, deep love and thanks and gratitude to you. And Jesus, I know that we are all gathered here today for a reason. Not by coincidence, but for a reason. And I am confident that you have something for each one of us to experience and hear from you today. So Spirit, may we be in tune to listen. May our, not just our ears be open, but our hearts be open too for what you have for us. And Jesus, we give you back all the praise and glory in your precious name. wonderful to be here with you today to worship the Lord, to remember what he did for us by uh, taking the bread and the cup together. Uh, just wonderful to be in his presence with you. Uh, we were away last week, but glad to be back with you today. And, and uh, actually, as we begin today, I want to uh, celebrate something that uh, God did among us in the last couple of weeks. Uh, two Sundays ago was our Great Commission Sunday. If you were here, you remember that? How many of you were here that day? Um, and, and we uh, together celebrated what God is doing around the world. And we uh, gave a special offering to the Great Commission Fund. And some of you have probably been wondering, well, what happened with that? Like, what was the total? What, what, what was given among us as a church? And so I want to report that to you. Uh, and we kind of have to look at a two-week span because uh, there was that day the offering was given, but uh, most of it was counted the next week, plus there was online giving that came in. All together was over $13,000 for the Great Commission Fund. That's awesome. Praise the Lord. What generosity from uh, our church family. That's more than we ever would, would imagine to hit in a month, but for that month alone of October, it's going to be over... Fifteen to towards sixteen thousand uh, dollars given to the Great Commission Fund in one month. That, that's incredible. I just want to say thank you. Uh, that this re reflects your heart for the world. That we want to see the good news of Christ get to every nation. Uh, and also with that, uh, you should know that's on top of what was given for Envision Acres Farm and Matt and Stephanie Stein uh, for that little season of, of time, end of September into October, was eleven thousand uh, dollars. So put those together. It's just an incredible uh, amount of generosity. So I just want to say thank you and report that to you. Uh, I love being part of a church that wants to see the nations reached for Christ. Uh, that just makes my heart glad, and I'm all in with you if you're all in with me. Yeah? All right, we're going to turn toward Proverbs chapter 3. I invite you to open your Bibles there this morning. And the question I have at the beginning of this message is, Kind of one that, that might, might uh, hit us in the forehead a little bit. Are we wealthy? Now, judging by what we just talked about and the giving that just came in for World Missions, we might think, well, yeah, that kind of hints toward, yeah, there's wealth here in our church. But let me ask you this way. Do you consider yourself wealthy? 
And it probably depends on how you compare that. If, if you compare it to uh, your rich uncle, uh, you might think, well, no, <laughs> that guy's got money, that, not me. If you compare yourself to uh, the neighborhood in town that you think of, that they got really big houses and, and those people have money, I, I, I don't. Then we might think, well, I'm not really wealthy. But if we compare ourselves to those who have less than us, we might realize, yeah, we actually are kind of wealthy. And when I was 17, I had my first opportunity to travel outside the United States of America. Got to go uh, to the country of Chile or Chile for those who speak Spanish. Uh, and so as I was down there, uh, we got to travel around a little bit, and we were taken to this village where uh, people had, in the last couple of years, received Christ. There were some alliance missionaries who had gone into this village, and, and many people had received the Lord. There were several churches planted among the Mapuche people. Uh, it's a, a people group uh, native to Chile, and uh, it was incredible to have the privilege to walk into that village. Uh, they were all dirt roads. There were no cars, a few bicycles, uh, kids running around in bare feet, chickens in the yard running around everywhere, which was pretty cool. No phones, no TVs. Uh, the houses were one-room huts with sticks and mud and, and things like that. And as I walked into that village, I really realized for the first time how privileged we are in the United States of America. I wouldn't have considered my family wealthy by any means. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about that in, in a few minutes. But uh, we actually do have a lot. In fact, if, if you came here today and you arrived in a car and you had breakfast this morning and you had a bed to sleep in last night and a roof over your head, if you have even a dollar to your name, you have wealth. And it was given to you by God. And it's into that that the Lord wants to speak to us today from Proverbs, from, from a, a book of the Bible that is almost 3,000 years old and yet speaks right to our hearts today. And so uh, I want us to, to look there uh, together. Uh, now, as we do this, I want to acknowledge that last week this, this series was kicked off by Pastor Randy, who's a retired pastor in our congregation, and I love when he preaches. He uh, started off this series, and, and I think I need to go to him this morning and say, Randy, I need the car keys back. <laughs> Yeah, so, so la <laughs> last week I was uh, sitting in a place far, far away from here going, please don't wreck the car, please don't wreck the car, <laughs> and it doesn't have a scratch on it, Randy. If you, if you don't know what that's about, go back and listen to last week's message. Um, I really appreciate how you brought God's word to us, Randy, this morning, um, and as we get into this, he highlighted how... The book of Proverbs was written by King Solomon, and he was writing to his son, my dear son, and it perhaps is Rehoboam, his son who became king after him, and, and Solomon wanted to impart wisdom from God that he had learned, and through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit had written down, is now preserved for us today, and God wants to speak to us. The key of, that, of this chapter is verses that probably resonate with you. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. That's verse five. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. It won't always be an easy path. It might have its ups and downs, but God will direct your path if we trust him. And so we're looking at this chapter in light of trusting God for all these different uh, things that he has to say to us. And let's look at our text Verses 9 and 10. It says, Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing, and your vats will brim over with new wine. Now, if you were here last week as well, you, you recognize that one of the things Pastor Randy pointed out was that every one of these Proverbs uh, has a pattern to it. If you, you go back and read through, most of the Proverbs will have a positive command 
and or a negative command, and then a reward or promise attached to it. This, these two verses have two parallel positive commands, what we should do, and then they have two parallel rewards. So let's read it again through those eyes. Honor the Lord with your wealth. And here's the parallel. It's kind of grabbing honor the Lord from the first line. It says, so honor the Lord with the first fruits of all your crops. Those are the two positive commands. Then here are the parallel rewards. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing, and your vats will brim over with new wine. God will provide all of your needs. And so we're going to really spend most of our time on, on verse 9. We'll, we'll pull back into verse 10 at the very end. And so let's, let's pull these apart a little bit. Honor the Lord with your wealth. Now, just a few minutes ago, we established that all of us have wealth of some kind. May it all have, not, not all have the same wealth, uh, but even if you're a kid, hi, Canyon, uh, even if you're a teenager and you're living at home um, and you have food that your parents provided, you have a, a home that you can live in, God has given you a wealth by the people that you know, the people that love you. If you are a poor, broke college student here today, let me hear you. <laughs> well, there was a lack of enthusiasm. Is it because I said poor and broke before I introduced you, right? Um, even if you're taking out loans to complete your degree, you have a wealth in the very fact that you can attend a university and, and achieve an education and that you can go into this, the meal uh, cafeteria and, and scan your card and you can get all the food you want at a college cafeteria. Even if you're an adult here who's launched into adulting and you barely have two nickels to rub together. I, I've been there. Um, you still have two nickels to rub together. <laughs> you have a little bit of wealth. Or if you're an adult here in this room and you've kind of gotten a little bit of breathing room in your finances and you're going, oh, this is nice. Like, all right, uh, we're, we're doing okay. You have wealth. All of us have wealth, and the command here is to honor the Lord with it. Your wealth is what you already have. It's what has been saved up. It's what has been invested. It's all the possessions that you have. It's all the options that you have. Honor the Lord with it. This word honor is the same word in the, the Hebrew language for glorify. So let's insert that word. Glorify the Lord with your wealth. With the wealth that you have, find ways to use it that glorify God. All that you have been given, glorify God with it. Obey God with it. Praise God with it. Use it for his purposes. That's the meaning of this first part of verse 9. The second part, again, takes the idea of honoring the Lord, glorifying the Lord, but it changes the subject of what we're, of what we're supposed to honor him with. And it's our first fruits. Now, we may not be familiar with that word uh, in our culture, but if you live in an agricultural culture like Israel was, you would have uh, seasons of produce that happen in, in your life. Some of you have gardens or hobby farms, and you get this. Uh, some of you have tomato plants, and you get this. If you have first fruits, what it is would be that uh, as the first of the grain comes ripened and you harvest that. Or your trees have figs or olives on it. Or you have livestock that reproduce. Or you have sheep that you can shear the, the wool off of. The command here in the, Israel, uh, in the Old Testament law for Israel, Leviticus 23 outlines this, is that they were to take the first fruits, the first part of that harvest, and bring it to the Lord as an offering at the temple. In fact, the, the command is that you should bring that first part before you go back and, and finish harvesting the rest. That your first and best goes to the Lord. Now, what does that look like in our culture? Well, we probably don't have a lot of produce. Maybe you do, but 
what this would look like for us is more like your paycheck that comes in. What do you give to the Lord right off the top? When you have an investment that matures and you get a dividend, what do you do right off the top with that? As you receive, as your bounty increases, honor the Lord with that. So these are the two commands that we have from the Lord here. What you already have, your wealth, and what you are producing, your first fruits, honor the Lord with it. God calls us to be a people who are generous toward him and toward his work, and there are ways that we are to honor God with it. Now, as I look through the scriptures and, 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 and think about what are the ways that God calls his people to recognize his hand in giving us these things and, 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 and calling us to be generous back to him with it, I, I find several categories of things that he told us to do. And so I'm going to walk through those this morning. Some of them will move kind of quick. Some will go a little bit slower. And the principles of these things still apply to us today. Okay, you guys ready? The first thing that we see in Scripture that we're told to do as a way to honor God with these things is a tithe. You've probably heard the, the, the phrase tithes and offerings. It's from uh, Old Testament Scriptures. And, and people were to bring to the temple a tithe. What is a tithe? Well, it simply means a tenth. That's... That's the word. Bring a tenth of all that you produce. Bring it to the Lord. In the Old Testament, there was, uh, especially as Israel was was a kingdom, it was kicked off. There was a tabernacle. Uh, There was then later a temple that was built physically. And and so people would bring in a tenth of all that they produced, uh, whether that was by season, whether that was uh, whatever rhythm they had things coming in, would bring this tenth to the Lord. And they would, it would be the way that the, the ministry of God was carried forward in the nation of Israel. So how did the Levites and the priests eat? How did they put food on their table? How did they have anything uh, when they were working in God's ministry? Well, the tenth came in from everybody else. How were they able to carry on the ministry around the temple? Well, it's because of what was brought in, whether it was grain, whether it was oil, whether it was animals, whether it was money. It's how the temple ministry continued forward. It's how God's presence was fostered in Israel. It was the regular way that everything was supported. And there were times when people didn't bring that in, and and times when the temple fell into disrepair, and, and there were very few priests and Levites willing to serve anymore because there was nothing for them. And so that's the way it carried on. And still today, that's how God's ministry is carried on in the place of regular ministry. It's it's when God's people bring their tithes into the local church. Now, you might wonder, okay, what is this, this tenth? Do, do we still need to do that percentage? Because that was Old Testament law. We're here in the New Testament era under Christ's ministry. And, and I would say to you that the tenth is still the benchmark. It's still, it's still an aim to, to hit that we would give 10% of all that we have to the Lord. And maybe you aren't there yet. It might, might be a benchmark for you to work up to. Maybe you're already at 10 and you think, well, maybe the Lord's calling me to give more than that. That's okay. But it's still a benchmark for us to aim after. In fact, if you want to know what the New Testament would say about it, in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, we are told that we are to give like Christ gave to us. Now, let me ask you, what did Christ give to us? Everything. Everything. Right? He gave his very life. So actually, in the New Testament light, 10% is a good deal um, that God, God's saying to give that. So bring your tithe. Now, for me, uh, my first job that I had, I was 14 years old. Uh, it was not a like on-the-books official job. It was actually kind of a side job where a lady who was older, um, she was a retired opera singer, and was like a huge personality and wanted to live on her own. So she needed people to come in and help her so she didn't have to go to a retirement home or something like that. Physically, she wasn't in good health, but she had a dog 
and she wanted her dog walked. She had a house that had stuff all over it, like music books and, and all kinds of memoirs and pictures. She wanted to go through these rooms and have things sorted. And, and when I got old enough to drive when I was 16, I kept working for her. She wanted me to run her errands, and she wanted uh, me to water plants around the house and all that kind of stuff. So she would pay me a little bit of money. And my parents, in their wisdom, said, okay, this is your first job. You need to begin tithing. You need to begin giving to the Lord. So they, they explained to me, okay, all that came in, you need to take a tenth of that, set that aside, and you're going to give that to the Lord at church. And I'm like, okay, I can do that. Uh, and the rest of it, they said, save it. I'm like, oh. <laughs> don't I get to spend any of it? No, no. Uh, okay, a little bit. I did get to spend. Um, and then my next job that overlapped with this one was I started working at Chick-fil-A. That was my first real job that I had pay stubs, and, and that's before any sort of like direct deposit. So you guys remember, you, like, you had to go in and get your paycheck, and then you had to go to the bank. So I got a bank account set up, and, and now all that I had saved, I put in that savings account. And, and then as I worked, uh, it would all go in there, and then I would take a tenth back in cash, and I would give that to the church. And, and I, was, I was like, okay, we got this. This is good. And I, and I worked my tail off to pay for college. Kids, are you in the room? You listen to this? Save money. Work and save money for college because it shouldn't just be a free ride from your parents or from the government or somebody else. <laughs> right? Um, it's good to learn to work. But as you work, set aside that tenth for the Lord. Now, as we were teaching our kids to do this, um, we, we, we heard this idea that someone said to get three jars and put them on their dresser in the room and label them. One jar is the spend jar, one jar is the save jar, and one jar is the give jar. So our kids, as they would receive money when they were little, we started this at like age five or six or something like that, um, not their birthday money. We didn't make them divide it up into those, uh, you know, if they got money from grandma or whatever, that, would, that could all go in the spend jar. But Anything that they did for little side jobs or their monthly allowance, we had them divided equally in the three jars. Now, let me tell you about the allowance. We did not believe that our kids should be paid for doing chores. They just got to do that because they're part of the family, right? So that was our, our philosophy. But we wanted to give them a little bit of money, like in numbers divisible by three, like six bucks a month. So they would have $2 to put in their spend jar, two in their save jar, and two in their give jar. And then um, when they got old enough to open savings accounts, all that money in that save jar, which had turned out to be like 100 bucks or 200 bucks, ended up going straight into their bank account. They had something to open a bank account with one day. But the give jar, we would have them bring it in and personally give it at church with their own hands. So they understood, oh, I'm giving to the Lord. I'm giving to his work. And if there was a special thing like a missionary offering or, or the Great Commission Fund, we had them even sometimes bring from their uh, other jars to give like that. And they understood, okay, I'm supposed to give to the Lord. It's what he commands us to do in Scripture. Parents, teach this stuff to your kids. It's going to be simple things that you can do. But they need to learn from a young age to be giving. Because when you get older, maybe there's a few amens on this one, if you've never been giving before in your life, it's a whole lot harder to start then. Okay, maybe a few amens. Um, as, as we got married, Lisette and I, we have kept that 10% benchmark uh, since we, we had only two nickels to rub together. What's 10% of 10 cents? I mean, two, two cents. We, we, one cent. We give to the Lord. I don't know. She does all the math in the family. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> and uh, we've been doing it ever since. And sometimes we give more because we feel the Lord calling us to do that. So tithes. Folks, and I want to make a note here. We're all in this together. When I say that, I mean you all and me and our pastoral staff. We get paid through the offerings that you bring. Thank you. But you're not giving to us. You're not even really giving to the church, though you are. You're giving to the Lord. And so the same principle that causes you to say, I'm going to give to the Lord, is the same principle that tells us, even though we've received our income through the church, is we're going to give back to the Lord. 
And so we do that faithfully because it's a statement that God, what I have is given from you, and so I'm giving back to you to acknowledge that it's yours. Okay? The next thing that we're told in Scripture to do is offerings, tithes and offerings. Offerings are when we give toward a special thing that's above and beyond the tithes. And can I, can I make that clear? Sometimes we have the thought, well, I'm going to give to this good thing that, that the Lord wants me to give to, and so I'm just going to take from the tithe and give it as an offering. Well, then you haven't given your full tithe. <laughs> we give above and beyond our tithe to special things like offerings. What kind of offerings are we talking about? In the Old Testament, they had guilt offerings and sin offerings and grain offerings and fellowship offerings, and, and then they would have uh, like giving toward a project, like the temple needed to be repaired or needed to be built or whatever it took, something that was above and beyond. Those were offerings. You know, oh, even special feasts and celebrations in their nation. And the same kind of thing is true of us. When there's a special type of offering, then we're going we're gonna to say, okay, Lord, what do you want me to give? And we'll go above and beyond. Like, let's say when the students are going to the Life Conference next summer, and we say, hey, we're going to have a special uh, uh, offering for that. Would you, would you give to that? Or to our scholarship fund. We have, we have six students receiving scholarships uh, who are studying toward ministry. And the fund is not fully replenished for December's disbursement. So I'll just put that out before you. Uh, and it'll need it again in, like, May or June. So... We give offerings to the Lord. Or if there's a building project, we give to him. The next kind of thing is, and you might wonder, why didn't I mention this before in, in offerings? It's because I want to make this a special category, is, is supporting missions work or church planting. This is the kind of thing that, that has a, a lot of importance. Because as much as the gospel came to you, we need to make sure that the gospel goes beyond us to the rest of the world. And many of you support individual missionaries. Uh, in the Alliance, we call them international workers because we don't want to give them the title missionaries because they can get in trouble wherever they serve. So we call them international workers, a very plain word. Uh, but many of you support international workers. You might support local church planters or organizations that are doing that kind of missions work. And so this is another category of how we give. If you look now in the New Testament, you'll find the Apostle Paul uh, who worked uh, a side job to support himself, but there were many churches that decided, Paul, we're going to get behind you and your team because as much as you came and, and brought the gospel to us, we want to make sure that the rest of the world hears about it too. So in Philippians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul is writing them. He says, thank you so much for how you have given toward my needs. And it was Paul and Timothy and Silas, his whole team, because the people in Philippi knew that they needed to eat. They needed to be able to pay their lodging. They needed to be able to take care of their basic needs. And, and they gave on purpose to Paul and his team to see that they could go forward. Paul says to them, I am amply supplied. Can you imagine for our missionaries to be able to say, I'm amply supplied? When's the last time you got a newsletter that said, Hey, stop giving. It's all good. Like, I've got enough. <laughs> That's what Paul was basically saying to them. He was amply supplied because the people had such a generosity flowing from them. They said, I'm going to give toward that. So for us in our context, we talk about the Great Commission Fund. That's the, the big offering we did in, in the month of October. And, and $16,000 was given to the Great Commission Fund. That's incredible. That's how we keep them doing what they do best so they don't have to be worrying about the money. So out of the generosity of our hearts, we give. And our church, folks, I, I'm, this is commending you before the Lord. Our church gives well over $100,000 a year toward missions. You might not see that fully in your bulletin. We're tracking, I don't know where it's at right now, uh, and we're at the end of October, beginning of November. But there's actually more categories than show up in the bulletin when you give to individuals and you give toward special projects and all that. When you total that together, I think last year was $130,000. That's incredible, folks. That's not like we're taking from our general budget giving and saying we're going to take a portion of that and give it to missions. No, this is you give to the general fund and you give to missions. 
in our family, we give our tithes, and then we have set apart another amount that we give towards supporting missions work. I encourage you to do that. Make this a priority in your home. The next category I want to talk about is helping those in need. People in need. We're commanded over and over again to give toward the poor or those brothers or sisters who have needs among us. Proverbs 19.17 says this, Whoever is generous to the poor lends to the Lord. And I realize that's in a proverbial kind of way of speaking. But we become his hands and feet as we give toward those who have need. So if you have a family member who has a need and, and you feel prompted from the Lord, if it's wise and if it's, if it's right and the, and the Lord says yes, and you give toward them, you're his hands and feet. As you give toward an organization like, uh, like um, 180 Ministries or um, New Hope Ministries here in town, or you give to our benevolent fund here at church, which is how we have the ability to help people within our church who apply and, and people from outside of our church who apply. As you give to a neighbor, as you give to someone in our church that has a need. It, it's ways that we are honoring the Lord with what he has given us. I can tell you, uh, I, I, as a pastor, don't know who gives what. That's a blessed ignorance that I have, right? So as I walk around, don't ever go like, oh, he doesn't know that we for, He knows that we forgot our, our tithe this week. Like, I'll never know that. Uh, or, hey, we gave a lot, huh? Hey, pastor, I'll never know that. So don't, don't look at me like I know those things. I don't know who gives what even to individuals. Usually that's kept from my knowledge, and I love that. But I have been on this, the side of seeing people blessed in our church when they've had a need, and they can say, Pastor, you wouldn't believe it, but we had this need, we had no money, our car was broken down, and, and, and someone gave the exact amount that we needed. Like, those kinds of things are incredible stories. And you all do that. You step up and you help one another. Praise God. That's honoring him with what he has given you. Do you, do you feel like, like, okay, there's a lot of ways we honor the Lord. There's one more I want to point out, but it's, it's probably a little different way of thinking, and it could be 10 sermons of its own, but I'm going to just briefly say it here. It's managing our money well. Your investments, your savings, your monthly budget, Managing it well. For instance, hey, I, I think we need a new car. I don't know what kind of car. I don't know where it's going to come from. And you start looking at things. Instead of just simply researching, instead of just simply going, what do we want? Do you stop and pray and invite the Lord into your finances? Do you consider, God, what do you want me to do with this? Or you get a bonus at work. God, what do you want me to do with this? Is there anything that you have plans for this that I haven't considered yet? We're supposed to find somewhere to live, to rent, or to buy. God, where do you, will you lead us specifically? We don't want to misuse the money that you're entrusting to us. So show us what we should do. Pray about it. Also, have discipline about it. You know we live in a world where we're bombarded by advertisements and by stuff that smells good. You drive down Cumberland Parkway, and there's like, there's like Restaurant Row. I know it's not really the most fancy one, but you got Arby's, and you got Starbucks, and then you got Wendy's, and around the corner, way back in, you got Cracker Barrel, if you can ever find it. Uh, <laughs> and you go, oh, I, I, it's, it, you know, it's 5.30. We haven't planned for dinner. Well, let's go out to eat. And before you know it, you've burned like 40 or 50 bucks when you could have gone home if you had made a plan and spent 10 bucks or 5 bucks. It's planning well. It's being responsible. It's creating a budget. It's living with discipline on that budget so that you have extra to be able to give to God and do with what he tells you to do. Now, it also means that you need to save money. It also means you need to take care of your family. It means you need to pay your bills. It means maybe you need to support your aging parents or, or whatever it may be. Manage it well in a godly way, and there's so much the Scripture has to say about those things. Pay off debt. Don't take on a bunch of debt. 
These are ways that we honor the Lord with what he's given us. Now look at all these. Dream with me for a moment. What if all Christians did this and did it well? Can you imagine what it would be like? Can you imagine the Christian and Missionary Alliance going, hey, you won't believe it. We have an excess of $3 million that we don't know what to do with, and we're, we're wanting to send missionaries to more places, and now we need more people willing to go. Like, can you imagine if the money was outrunning the needs? <laughs> like, that would be amazing. Can you imagine it, it, what would our community be like if there were so many Christians helping the poor that we did more than what the government could ever do? I'm not trying to overstep the government, not trying to belittle their role, but aren't Christians supposed to have a role there? What if we sat around in our governing board meetings here at the church and went, well, there's another $30,000 extra. <laughs> I don't know, what are we going to do with it? I don't know, what a great problem to have. Like, God, what do you want us to do with this? Like, this is what it would be like if every Christian simply did as the Lord commands. But you all know as well as I do, this isn't the reality, is it? Some statistics. Did, did some research this week. There's lots of studies you could look at. This one in particular is dead on with everybody else. It's from 2024. It says, two point, uh, Christians who attend church give 2.8% of their income to the church. Well, I'm glad they're, they're giving, but that's an average, which means th those who are giving 10% or more, like there's people who give none. In fact, there's a third of Christians who attend churches that never give anything to their local church. And the Lord would say, that's not honoring me with what I've given you. Half of all Christians don't give to any charitable organization outside of their local church. Which would mean they're not giving to the Great Commission Fund, which would mean they're not giving to New Hope Ministries, which would mean they're not giving to, to any sort of missional uh, group outside the church. I, I want you to be generous to, to groups outside the church. It's good. Half of Christians don't even do that. So it tells me something is blocking us. Something is holding Christians back from, from being able to give like God says to give. There's places for us to grow in this. And so in that spirit, I, I want to just share maybe some of my suggestions why we might not be giving in a way that honors the Lord. And, and mind you, I thought of these while I was sitting on a beach far, far away from here. <laughs> um, it was our 25th anniversary. Did I say that? Or it's coming up in December. So we took a trip last week. Uh, really enjoyed it. Yeah. Yay. Thank you. And so they're going to sound a little bit funny in their titles. But I think they're right on as I've sat on this and thought about it. The first one is this. The... It's mine syndrome. It's mine. Has anyone ever raised a toddler? <laughs> anyone work in the nursery here in church? Mm hmm. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. A kid will come up to some toys and start playing with them, and another kid comes up and wants to play with the same toys, and the one kid goes, It's mine! <laughs> Pulls it away and says, You can't have this. I mean, it's funny, in the nursery, these kids, they, they didn't even know about that toy or forgot about it from last week until like five minutes ago, until they came in there. And now, all of a sudden, all those toys are theirs, right? They didn't earn it. They didn't pay for it. They didn't work for it. it it's never been theirs. It's to share, but they think it's mine. And this is exactly what we do as soon as things come into our possession, it's easy to give away other people's money, isn't it? What if I came to you and, and I, every person who walks out this morning, we gave you $100 and I'm like, here, here you go, here you go, here you go. And you, you took the $100 and the one stipulation was you have to spend that on somebody else by the end of today. If you go out to lunch, don't buy your own lunch with that, but buy someone else's lunch with that. 
or go to the grocery store and pay for someone's grocery bill with that. Wouldn't that be kind of fun, right? It's easy to give it away because it was never yours to begin with. However, the longer you held on to it, the more you might be going, hmm, I have some ideas for this. And, and we just change so quickly. As soon as something's in our hands, we think, it's mine. Like, I worked for this. Right? If you get a paycheck, yeah, I worked for this. I'm the one who put in the hard blood, sweat, and tears. I'm the one who got up early in the morning and, and, and worked for this. And God wants to let us know. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. So how did you get up and go to work in the morning? Who gave you the health to get out of bed? God did. You might have worked the job, but God gave you that. Who gave you the job in the first place? God. Who gave you the, the, the gifts and talents and, and, and brain power to be able to do what you did at your job? God did. Who gave you the physical strength to do the job? God did. Who gave you the breath in your lungs to be able to live? Who made the world spin around so that you knew when it was night and you knew when it was day and you knew what time it was to go to work and, and things continued on in motion? Who caused the rain to fall so that crops could grow and animals could feed and, and you could have food on your table? God, God, God did it. We cooperate with him. We have a role to play. But all of it is God's. You know, what would it be like if we rejected that lie and believed the foundational truth that everything I have is actually God's? What, what if we could really acknowledge that and instead of having things in, in our hands and, and, and we go, it's mine, we were able to go, you're entrusting it to me for now to manage, but it's yours. What does that look like in your heart and soul this morning to, to hold it open-handed and he's able to put things in and you're able to manage it, but then when he wants to move it for some other purpose, you're, you're like, okay, God, it's yours. How, how about another thing that we could reject? We live in a culture that idolizes money that idolizes things, and, and, and we want to have nice things. We're able to buy comfort. We're able to buy status. We're able to, to buy whatever we want and put it on credit if we can't even afford it. And so everybody goes around like, well, I want that car, and I want those kind of clothes, and I want to eat that today. And you're actually more important. You have more value in our culture by being able to do that. That's wrong. That, that's not right. Yeah, I, I want my clothes to say, like, Levi's on my jeans and not the old <laughs> other jeans. I, I, I want to I have my sweatshirt have the Nike swoosh on it uh, because it's better when it has that swoosh than when it doesn't have a swoosh, right? I mean, that's the way our world thinks. And listen, I know, I get it. I, my house, when growing up, I wore hand-me-downs my entire childhood. I was in style, but it was 10 years too late, right? I get it. It's nice to have something that's nicer. Uh, if I did get something new, it was bought at Kmart, <laughs> not at the mall. Uh, actually, in one period of my life, for four years, we lived in Toccoa, Georgia, which at that time didn't even have a Kmart. It had something called Sky City. And I remember going with my mom to buy a new pair of shoes for school, and we went to Sky City, and I was like, oh, mom, you're killing me. Like, really? I don't want to buy my shoes at Sky City, but we did, <laughs> with my jeans that had patches in it, right? I get it. But this world is trying to sell us a bill of goods that our worth comes from what the label says and what things look like. And we need to give so that we can, we can tear down that idol in our life that says money is God. And we say, no, it's not God. He's God. And I'm going to give to show that I don't believe that lie. I'm going to tear that down in my life. The it's mine syndrome needs to be rejected. And maybe God needs to do a work in your heart today. Or this week, as you consider this and you think through, why do I spend how I do? And, and do I really have money as an idol in my life? 
It's so subtle. It's so sneaky. We've got to tear down that idol. Next one. <laughs> Remember, I was on the beach. <laughs> What's the plan, Stan? <laughs> Most people don't have a plan for their money. Your money has a plan for you. Half of all Americans live from paycheck to paycheck. What that means is you get a paycheck, you spend it immediately, and then you have no money left when the next paycheck comes, and you're in emergency mode, so that you get the next one, and then you spend all that, and then, then you have nothing left until the next one comes. Part of that can be when you fall on hard times. Part of that can be when you have a low income. But for the most part, it's because people don't live within their means. We don't have a plan to live within the means of, of the amount that God has given us. Folks, every person needs a plan, a.k.a. a budget. And we have to live on that budget. How will you ever give your first fruits to the Lord? There's a plan, there's a commitment that says, God, whatever comes in, I know taxes have to go, go and be set aside, but my next thing is that I'm setting aside the amount that you have put in my heart to give to you. I want to honor you with my wealth. And then I have certain commitments of, of a, a rent to pay and, and this bill to pay and this insurance to pay and my cell phone bill and all that. And then if we have anything left over, then we can ask the Lord, how do you want me to use that? Spend a little bit here or give a little bit more or, or, or whatnot. Usually we flip it. People in our culture flip that. They say, I got my money and now I'm going to pay a couple of bills, but then I'm going to go and spend it on this and on this and on this. And then, oh, if I have anything left over, then I'll give to the Lord. Well, you know what happens. There ain't nothing left over <laughs> to give to the Lord. And if you have $20 in your pocket at church and you're like, oh, I feel guilty, I should give then we feel like he's prying that last $20 out of our hands to give. That's not how we should approach life. I want to just encourage you, if you don't have a plan, you don't know where to start, you don't, you don't know if you have the accountability to stick with it, we are planning to offer a class in the new year, sometime in the spring. You can watch for details called Financial Peace University. It's about trying to get peace in your finances and have a plan, Stan. Now, there's a graphic you, you can put up there about that, just so you kind of get this graphic in your mind. Cue the graphic. Uh, so, uh, Financial Peace University, we're hoping to have that class offered next year. If you don't know, if you can't wait till then, Talk to one of our pastoral staff. We'd love to help point you to some books or some things that are helpful or some people in our church that would sit down and meet with you about that. Last thing, and we'll, we'll kind of end on this. Remember, I was at the beach. Can't trust this. Dun, 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 dun. MC Hammer, 1990s, anybody? Okay. My pants aren't big enough, you know, <laughs> wide enough for this. It comes back to this word that we started with. The Pastor Randy showed us last week. Trust. Trust is the operative word here. And it's going to apply on every sermon that we have going through Proverbs chapter 3. Do we really trust the Lord? Do we trust that this is right from his word, what he's telling us? Do we trust that if we do it, he's going to provide for us? Do we, do we trust that he really cares about our needs? You know, trust is so important. It's what gets things done. If my doorbell rings this afternoon and I see someone out the window that I don't trust, I'm not opening the door for that person. If they look threatening in any way. If that, I, I, if I don't trust them, I'm not going to let them into my house. If we don't trust God, we're never going to let them into our finances. We'll never open that front door and say, okay, God, you can come in. You can rearrange the furniture, and we'll run the house like you say. It comes down to trust. Trust in the Lord. We'll go ahead and put that verse on the screen, actually. Maybe we can read it together. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. 
In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. That's what it comes down to. Do you trust the Lord enough to glorify him with what he's given you? Do you trust the Lord enough to obey him with what he's given you? Do you trust the Lord to honor him with what he has given you? Speaking of trust, remember I said there's two positive commands he tells us to do, and then there's a promise. Listen, the Lord says, if you do this, I've got your back. Verse 10, then your barns will be filled to overflowing, and your vats will brim over with new wine. I would never hold this in front of you and say, if you give to the Lord, God will make you rich. No. It's not what this means. It's not what the context of Scripture means. If you give to the Lord, there's going to be sacrifice. In fact, King David said, I will will not give something to the Lord that that costs me nothing. Like, if I'm really going to honor him, it's got to hurt. Okay? Giving hurts. Giving is a sacrifice. Giving means you might do without some things. Giving means you're going to have to have discipline. But God says, I'll meet your needs. Every time we trust the Lord enough to obey him, it's an opportunity for him to reveal himself to us. Every time we trust the Lord to obey him, it ends up building up our trust muscle even more because he proves himself faithful. Do you want to see the Lord prove himself faithful to you? Then do what he says in all kinds of things in life. When I was 15 years old, I I surrendered my life to the Lord for the first time. Really, really surrendered my will. And before that, I had been worrying, God, if I do that, then you're going to make me do things I don't want to do, or you're going to make my life miserable, take the fun out of my life. And I discovered when I laid my life down to the Lord, I was actually more full in my heart than I had ever been before. And I've followed him, not perfectly, but I've followed him and trusted him on decision after decision. And here I'm before you guys today because of a decision I made at 15 years old. And God has revealed himself over and over. Do you trust him enough to obey what he says? So let's bring this to a conclusion this morning. What's your next step? What's your next step? We'll go ahead and put back on the screen those five things. As you look at these, is there, is there something in, in your life that, as we've talked about these this morning, God's going, hey, let me in the front door here on this. Trust me. Is there something he's asking you to do? Whether it's in the area of tithes, of hitting a certain benchmark in in your life. Maybe it's increasing that or starting it for the first time. Is it in an area of offerings, something he's put on your heart to give toward? About the area of supporting missions work or church planting to further the gospel in other places? Is there a need that he wants you to give toward? Or do you need to begin managing your money differently and allowing him to prioritize all of the ways that you spend and save and give? As he's doing that in your heart, I want to invite you into a posture of prayer. Prayer is a two-way conversation. We talk to God and God talks to us. And so... Uh, Holy Spirit, as we take these moments just to reflect, will you speak to us? We want to hear your voice. And so God, all, all across this room, what step would you have to take, even if we're a teenager or if we're in retirement or anywhere in between? What would you have us do to honor you with our wealth and with the first fruits of what we produce?
Dear Father, if you told us that if the sparrows of the field are taken care of, how much more will you take care of us? Lord, we reaffirm our belief together that everything we have comes from you. That you've called us to make a plan for it in a way that will honor you, with you, and that you want us to trust you to take care of us if we obey you. I pray, O oh God, that whatever you have whispered into our hearts, we would walk forward with courageously in faith, knowing that you will take care of our needs. And so bless us this morning. God, we are grateful for all that you've given us, and we want to honor you above all things. We want to tear down the idols of our lives and of our culture around us and give in a way that is hilarious, in a way that is absurd, in a way that our culture would look at it. But it heaps a bunch of glory and honor and praise on you. You're worth it, Lord. You're worth it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.